Hey, hey, welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am your host, Kristen Ostrander, and today we are going to talk to a super awesome guest. He has been in Amazon business for since 2013, which considering all, all things considered, that, that makes you a vet. And like a lot of people have been starting up here, there, whatever, but the reality is there's a lot of people with a lot of experience and you guys know, I only want to bring you the best guests, people that are going to bring you valuable stuff that you can take action on right now and today. So I have Isaac Kuhlman with me today, and he has been an Amazon brand developer since 2013, responsible for, um, just take a breath, $12 million in revenue for him and his clients alike. He's the co-founder of Real Coaching with Kirsty Berry and they have helped thousands of Amazon sellers grow their businesses. So I'm really excited to have Isaac with us. Hi, Isaac. How are you today? I'm great. How are you doing, Kristen? I am fabulous. I'm glad that you're here today. And I can't wait to get into talking about today's topic because I got to tell you, my clients are very excited. My listeners are like, oh my gosh, this is the number one question everybody asks all the time. And of course, everybody wants to know, right? How do we find profitable products? How do we discover my niche, niche? Mm -hmm. Everyone says niche, everyone says niche. So we're just going with either one is correct at this point, depending on which part of the world or country you're from. So yeah. um, the, the riches are in the niches or the the reaches are in the niches. So anyway, whatever way you want to talk about it, the, for those of you guys who do not know, um, my wholesale bundle framework, this is step one. We're actually going to talk about step one. Is today, Step one is finding a niche or a category to sell products in. Everybody's like, yeah, I want to start on Amazon and I want to find products to sell, but I don't even know where to start. And after talking with Isaac, I know we are kindred spirits when it comes to um, using kind of a common sense approach to start looking mm -hmm. and finding products to sell. So um, first of all, Isaac, can you give us a little bit of background like what did you do before you started um, Amazon yeah so it's actually kind of an interesting story uh, <laughs> I was actually working at an indoor go-kart facility here in Las Vegas I was at um, the operations manager of one of the facilities here and I was essentially tasked with the with kind of not so overtly or not so covertly big giant task of make this facility profitable because it was never profitable in about 18 or 20 months since I opened. So then I'd actually come there and basically was given like a dead sinking. I was supposed to make it somehow. And uh, so I kind of was there for a couple of months before I started getting kind of the hang of what was happening. And I started to realize that, you know, there was a lot of this stuff was, it wasn't an, an issue of like getting more people in the building. It was actually getting the people in the building to kind of purchase either or to kind of stay a little bit longer and kind of like get more interest or whatever. So basically I found out that the main issue was that everybody that came in was doing a single race. And I, I looked at the metrics and I was looking at the data and it was saying like pretty much 90% of the people were buying one single race. So I kind of went back to my ideal client, which are people who love to race go-karts. And I was like, all right, well, if you're walking to a go-kart facility, do you just plan on like, when you walk in, do you plan on racing and walking out? Or do you kind of plan on like having as much fun as you possibly can? It's kind of like that Disneyland effect. Like you don't need land thinking I'm going to, I'm going to try to save as much money as possible. You're trying to spend as much money as it takes to have fun. So it's similar concept said, okay, look, do people like go kart racing? Hell yeah, they do. So let's, let's get them into some races. Cause it's most fun when they have some like time to get good at it. So the first race is always kind of the worst race and they got to get better as they go. So I started telling our, our, our people up, up at the cash registers, like, Hey, when people walk in, don't just say, welcome. Can I help you? You say, actually change the script to, Hey, welcome to the name of the facility. And, you know, can I interest you in a three race package today? And that perks their interest of like, Hey, you know what, actually, that's a great idea. Like, what is that? And it comes with three races, a t-shirt, you get to kind of hang out. And on the third race, you do like a, a little different format. So we started to see like, that just, I have to stop you there for just a second because yeah. um, everybody knows like, this is the key of bundling people before <laughs> we even go to bundling, which I know is, is not your expertise, but right away, my antennas went up and be like, hello, that's a bundle. You're thinking about yep. your customer and trying to give them a, you know, a deal there. So I love that concept. And I'm guessing that that made the company a lot more profit. Yeah. So that facility essentially went from never making profit to $6,000 in profit the first month we implemented it, then 12,000, then 30,000. And then by the time I quit the last month, at like halfway between last month, I think it was at 13,000 halfway through the, the fourth month. And that's when at that exact same time I was making this company money, they were saying, oh yeah, you can, 
we'll, we'll work you into a profit share position. Um, we'll, we'll actually, you know, give you back profit. And, and I actually went and did also a bunch of other stuff, like open a couple of facilities and was supposed to be giving like a big, nice big paycheck. But I found out quickly that the more I made this company and every company that I've ever worked for, the, the less that I actually get in return. I just, I just give more and then they take more and I still get the scrap. So I was like, all right, this is getting kind of old. Um, and then I actually, in that time, I actually uh, met a guy who was racing, who happened to be an Amazon seller. I'd really like to uh, get somebody to you know, run my business properly because I have a lot of online marketing experience and kind of like wholesaling and um, third party or uh, private label kind of distribution stuff, but I don't really know how to run per se. And I was like, all right, cool. So let's kind of see what your operations are. Let's see what we're, I'm not just going to, you know, quit and then come work for you unless I know what I'm doing. I didn't know anything about online saying I, I knew about like Facebook ads and social media and stuff, but I wasn't really good at anything. I wasn't using it for my own reasons or trying to build a business. So basically what I did was I, I, I started kind of getting to know his business and I quit my job at the, at the raceway at the go-kart facility. And I, and I started working with him the day before I was set to start his seller account got shut down for good reason. Uh, but he was doing over $300,000 a month in sales and to have that shut down was like, Oh, I just quit my job and now I'm out of another job. So I go back to begging for my old job back. But uh, in the end, we kind of just sat down, talked about what were, what our plans one, but plans were going to be, but essentially that was kind of a blessing in disguise because I had to learn everything so fast right away because we were like scrambling to get our revenue back. So we had to open another account, take out 90,000 units of inventory from the other account, send that back in piece by piece back to, you know, obviously we can't send in 90,000 when we start a new account. So we had to like do it bit by bit, try to sell the stuff and then send in bit by bit. So it took us like six months to get all that inventory back into Amazon. And then by December, so from April to December, we, had, we were back up to $500,000 a month. So in six months, I kind of got like a gigantic crash course about here's how you kind of do everything you need to know about Amazon and how you can actually make launches work and all this other stuff. But it was a quite a growing and learning experience of like, he have, I could have jumped on a, on a ship that was sailing smoothly, but instead it was like, now it's sunk to the bottom. Let's, let's bring it back up and rebuild the whole thing. You know, that's, that's super interesting to say that because honestly, I feel like those are the things that help us grow as entrepreneurs. It's not when everything is great that we really learn. We really learn the lessons and how to really run a business and what not to do when we're in the trenches and when we're in the, the trials and errors and things like, you know, account suspension and everything else like that. So as you were recovering and you're getting into, um, you know, are you still a partner with someone or do you have your own? Have you moved on for your, to your own type of company? Yeah, no. So that, that, that happened for about two years. And then uh, we went our own ways, mostly because the, the, the business style and, and techniques that he wants to incorporate were different than mine. And so I just said, I, again, I can make you money and you can pay me or I can go off and do this myself. And I don't have to have any of this power struggle or anything like that. So me running a business isn't the same as me owning the business. So um, I think it's just better if we take, take our own businesses separately. Yeah, that's, that's great. So when you, when you go off on your own, um, you know, obviously you started, did you start with profit private label and thinking about mm -hmm. that? Because, you know, a lot of times, a lot of people are, are attempting to start there and we know that that can be good, bad, and otherwise sometimes when we're, we're heading into private label. Um, but I think the number one question there is, how do you decide what to sell, when to sell, how to sell it? There's so many different products on Amazon. And I know from horror stories from my own clients and people coming to me after trying to begin with private label that uh, after, you know, thousands of dollars in savings and months and months, if not a year of investing time, energy, effort, research, and even importing that it's a complete fail. So um, when we go, when we get into this, I want to get into this topic of trying to find those because we talked about this common sense approach. So what was the first approach of a product that you were trying to sell? You don't have to disclose the product, I guess, mm -hmm. but um, the idea of like, where did you, how did you come up with your first product that you decided to invest in? Yeah. So it's, I had to look at things that I knew, things that I enjoy. I would never, you know, I, I didn't have, I don't have a kid. I didn't have like a kid at the time. I was what, 32 or something like that. 30, yes, yeah, something like that. Man, time seems to keep flying by. <laughs> uh, I was like 32 or 33 and I was like, all right, well, so I don't want to get a baby. Like there's lots of stuff that you can sell on Amazon, but I was like, I'm not interested in this stuff because it doesn't appeal to me. There are only a couple of categories that I really wanted to get into. 
And when I first started, I was like, okay, well, I, I have an interest in this one. And it's also kind of a lower competition type of market. So I actually went into the automotive accessories um, category and just started looking around. And I was like, yeah, I, I kind of know about cars. Uh, my dad grew up, or when I grew up, dad, my dad was always working on cars. So kind of know my way around it. Not, I'd never like built a car from scratch or anything like that, or done major engine work, but change some spark plugs, you can do an oil change if I have to, all that kind of stuff. And so I started working in that, in that, um, in that area and basically said, look, there's almost no competition here, especially five years, six years ago when I started that first brand, I was like, I can launch anything. And aside from a few products and I wasn't going to do parts cause I'm not going to have a part for like a Honda, a Toyota, like that would cost like so much money in inventory. So I picked very specific things that can be used on any car. And when I did that, you know, I was la launching the products and, and one of them was seasonal. So for winter, and I was like, immediately because i had launched two products in quarter four of i want to say it was like 2016 2015 something like that and immediately they started doing well and i was like oh cool so then i launched them in the uk and they immediately started doing well there and i was like oh this is really easy <laughs> but basically by by me just kind of doing what i always did for the other business like and then applied it to a low because we were doing really competitive categories like cell phone accessories weight loss supplements, all these other, all these other ones that we tell people not to do now um, because they're just so competitive. But I took that competitive edge that I had in those categories and applied it to a really non-competitive category and just murdered everybody. <laughs> it was like, I wasn't even trying to, I was just kind of keep under the radar. Like let's, you know, kind of do like a second, third or fourth kind of tier product, but it was immediately doing well. Um, and I was like, all right, well, you know, I can just keep doing this and, and, and working on that. And then now I've actually started a second brand. But the idea there was, it was always built around an interest that I had. I knew something about the products. I knew something about the client. I knew how to talk to them. I wasn't just going to go fish around on Amazon until I found the perfect product. I was going to find the, the interest or the, the, the first before I ever started, you know, seeing anything bigger than that. For sure. I, I love that because that's literally, this is why I know we had talked before and like, that's why we're so, you know, just kindred spirits there is because yeah. we kind of chuckle about the fact that like, I, I feel like we're in a world right now of overthinkers or people that, especially when you're new and you don't know what you don't know, you feel like you have to, um, you know, you're overthinking every little decision when the common sense approach to that, it, to the common sense approach to what products would you like to sell is as simple as start with what you know, start with your, I call it your knowledge bank. Everybody has a knowledge bank. And in this first section of my framework, I talk about this. I even have many YouTube videos and a free download about tapping into your knowledge bank about what you know about. And I think, you know, starting with things that you were comfortable and knowing about is really important. And let's talk about why, because we we both share the same idea here that you have to know your customer, your ideal client, your ideal customer on Amazon, or especially on Amazon, of who is going to purchase your product. What are their needs? What are their desires? What are their things? Because if your product doesn't meet a need or solve a problem, no one cares. That's just, let's, let's just be honest. There's a lot of products out there that no one really cares about either because they don't know their customer very well, or they don't know their ideal customer very well, or they don't know how to present their problem. So I know you said something really interesting because this, this is like the, the, question I get all the time or the response to, hey, just tap into your knowledge bank. Here's all these resources, like fill out this form and you'll know products by the end. People are like, oh, I don't have hobbies. I don't really have any special interests. I don't really know a lot about a product. So what you what you framed in that 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 conversation we had, I'd love for you to talk about that. So if people come to you and say, hey, I don't have any hobbies. You do music, but I don't do anything like that. I don't have hobbies. I don't know about anything. I don't know where to start. What yeah. What is your take on that? Yeah. So it really is a, a very common sense approach. So whatever you're doing, like, where do you spend your time? Are you spending your time in front of your computer? Are you spending your time in your kitchen and in your living room? Where are you spending your time? A lot of time. Okay. So then go to that room and look around you, like look around what is in your environment and then see, okay, look, Hey, is that a product? Hey, is that a thing? Hey, did I buy that? Did I purchase that from Amazon? Oh, sure enough. Half of the things in this room is probably purchased either online or in a retail store for the specific reason of you doing whatever you're doing in that room. So it's really like, instead of thinking internally about like all the things that you could do or want to do, it's really just going outside of yourself and then 
looking at your environment and thinking, oh, externally, what is happening around me? And what am I doing to spend my time and to make up my days? Even if it's not something you like to do. And that's actually kind of a good thing. Like things that people don't like to do are oftentimes really good product ideas and, and niche markets because you're trying to solve a thing that you hate doing more than you're trying to solve something that you love doing. So if you don't like doing something, it's a really good way to start a, a brand and a business as well. And I will say it, starting a business and a brand or whatever is not for everybody because not everybody has that passion and that fire to create something that's, you know, solving problems for people. And, you know, one, one story I heard Richard Branson tell one time was essentially he started Virgin airlines because he basically wanted to get on a plane and they, they, they had no times or something like that. And he didn't like, he didn't like it or something like that. So he basically got off the plane or was kicked off the plane. I can't remember what it was. And he basically then bought a plane. So that way he could have the plane do what he wanted to do. And he knew that other people would want these accommodations as well. So that's essentially what he did. Now I'm not saying we can all go afford a plane, mm -hmm. but we can afford businesses that, that provide practical solutions to the problems that we have. So I have problems. Now, Kristen, you got, I'm not saying you have problems, problems, but everybody's got problems. Oh, I got problems. <laughs> of everybody's got problems that they need to solve. And so all you got to do is find out what you need to solve or make better for yourself for the stuff that you're actually doing. And it's actually quite easy. So like, I can look around here, you know, even like, you know, I just got post-it notes. I got all sorts of stuff, staplers. That's just here. If I look behind me, you can see tons of musical stuff, right? Like I know that these are things that I'm interested in. So that's actually what my new brand is, is musical accessories. So these are things that people do. And, and they, they just have these blinders on that all they can get product ideas from is by looking on Amazon, you get product ideas from everywhere around you. And that's when you then take them and go look up, look them up on Amazon. I love, love, love that. And the funny thing is, is that you've never seen my framework. And so that's great because I love the fact that like, you're saying the things that I've been saying and it's just yeah. like in a different way. So people, what happens when you hear something not once, but twice and not from one expert from now two experts and probably many, many out there when it comes to, you know, a lot of people selling on Amazon don't necessarily see themselves as entrepreneurs or CEOs of companies or marketers or anything like that. They're just like, I'm just an Amazon seller. I just want to pay, sell products to make money on Amazon, work from home, whatever. But the reality is, like you said, it's not for everyone. These, you are a business owner. If you are starting and selling on Amazon, whether you're a sole proprietor or you've got an LLC or an S corp or whatever, you are a business owner. And therefore you must be thinking about your customer. Even if you don't know them, if you, even if you don't have a niche shop, like music accessories or something like that, you still need to know and define number one, who is going to buy this product? Is it going to be the end user or is it going to be the person that's going to give it to someone? So mm -hmm. sometimes we have end user products, right? The person themselves is shopping for something for themselves. Then you have a person shopping for someone else, whether it's a gift or a husband or a wife or something, so-and-so needs something. Um, and so thinking about prom uh, solving that problem. So all of you guys who have been listening and say, I don't have any hobbies. I'm not really into anything. I'm not all that, but you buy products probably every single day, whether it's on online or in a store, you buy groceries, you buy medicine, you buy gas for your car, you have shoes on your feet, you have socks, you have all these different things that you can start thinking about. So here's another thing that you said that I would love for you to expand on is talking about saturated markets, right? Because everyone says, okay, if I don't have any hobbies, I look around me, I'm like, okay, there's office supplies, there's grocery, there's health and beauty care, there's all these things, but all these these categories are very, very saturated or they're very, they're highly competitive saturation. So how do I, how do I get away from that? How do I pick something that not everybody is selling and how do I know it's going to sell? I mean, I know these are all big questions, right? But like yeah. first going through, you know, I'm trying to debunk the myth that everybody has um, <laughs> something that they can think about and sell. Even if you have no hobbies, you do have experience with life. Mm -hmm. So how do we get away from some of these saturated categories you speak of? Yeah. So if you ask me, I would say that obviously we don't do like digital medias. We don't do like clothing and certain other categories just because clothing has too much inventory. You have to actually have digital medias is basically selling information. Most people don't have that. Um, however, most other like normal product, physical product categories, I would say, except for weight loss supplements and some supplements in general, and cell phone accessories, I know that those two are probably the two most competitive. I would say stay away from those. Aside from that, you can actually find products 
in almost any category on Amazon in any niche. And the idea here is that a lot of people think that if you have a niche, you have to stay in that Amazon category. For example, if I'm in automotive accessories, I'm only supposed to sell automotive products. Well, yes, but that doesn't mean that I'm not going to have a product that's in a different, um, you know, different category. For example, I sell a product that happens to be on Amazon's category in the DIY space, but I sell it in the automotive space because it's for mechanics, but it happens to be in the DIY section. So now I'm in DIY and tools and automotive. I don't have to just stay on just automotive. So there's definitely more that an interest can expand upon than just one, one category. Secondly, when you're thinking about things that you want to sell, everybody wants to sell the cool, sexy products. And I'm going to tell you, cool, sexy products are actually harder to sell than boring stuff. <laughs> like I have a very, very, very boring product, but I know my ideal client very well. I kind of use some humor in the, in the listing and that thing, which I mean, it might as well be just a, a paperweight, but I mean, it actually has a function, but it is, it's about as exciting as a paperweight and it sells really, really well and has high conversion because of the way that you talk to the ideal client about that product. Cause nobody's going to get excited about this product. But when I write it with some excitement and, and some, you know, humor behind the listing, people buy it and it's, it has over a 45% conversion rate. It used to be actually over a 70% conversion rate, but it's kind of dipped over the last couple of years just because the market has gotten a little bit uh, more competitive, but still on, on a, in, a, in a December for that product, for example, I might do a hundred thousand dollars in sales on just that one product. So it does quite well for itself and it's not an exciting product. So you find these boring products that happen to be things that are either maybe complementary to the, the sexy product you were already trying to sell, or maybe even an accessory to that product. So one thing, like obviously, you know, cell phone accessories, I just use this example, not saying that you should do this, but you're not going to sell an iPhone, but you can sell a boring product like a screen protector or a boring product like a cell phone case. Now, those are very competitive. So I would say not to necessarily go into them, but there's things just like those out there for other products. You know, I don't know if you have maybe like a printer, but people need ink cartridges or they might need, you know, the, the, you know, power cable for the thing or whatever. Like there's lots of these little things that go around other products that people are like, Oh, I don't want to sell the thing like that, that goes with the thing. I want to sell the, the, the nice, sexy thing. It's like, well, good luck because everybody wants to sell that thing. And all you're doing is putting a lot of extra hardship on yourself. You could find a lot of great products in this complimentary or, you know, even accessory space that people just overlook all the time. Amen to that. And let me tell you, this is the, this is the essentials of bundling, right? So we don't necessarily sell the thing. As a matter of fact, I even go to the point of not even worrying about, like a lot of people think that something has to have a big, well-known household name brand for people to buy it. And so I'm always proving them wrong by saying, what is the um, brand name of the, um, paper clips that you bought last time? What's yep, the brand exactly. name of the staples? What is the brand name of your HDMI cable that you bought because you know you got a new TV? I mean, nobody, what's the brand name of the rug that's on your floor? Like 0% of people know the answers to that usually because like, I don't know what brand name my rug is, but I know that I needed that color rug and that style rug in this particular hallway runner, whatever it is. Or, you know, like you're, you're, some people are super brand loyal to some things and that's fine. There's plenty of um, market share for them to do that. But there are, there are, like you said, with the iPhone, I've done this with like GoPro accessories. So you cannot sell the GoPro necessarily, but you can have, and they make plenty of accessories for that carrying cases and all kinds of different ways you can wear and use a GoPro for all kinds of things, the rain shield and the this and the that. I mean, there's so many things and that's why bundling is so profitable when it comes to that, because you don't have to reinvent the wheel and you don't have to have a household name and you don't have to piggyback off somebody else's brand. Sell boring things that people are looking for on day to day. I am such an advocate for that because you know you don't have to sell the next trendiest thing, especially yeah. actually steer away from trends because trends come and go quickly. And then you're back to square one, figuring out which way. But honestly, like even you as a musician, um, think, you know, guitar strings, you know, our guitar strings, our guitar strings, and people have their different styles and shapes and sizes and gauges. But overall, the whole product in general hasn't changed a whole lot in however many years. So yeah. people that want that, want that, but they also buy other things with it, right? Like just different accessories. So I love, I love that. And I love reiterating the fact that 
you know, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be sexy. It doesn't have, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, just mm -hmm. figure out what's around you and figure out first what problem you're going to solve. So you said you, you're a biker, right? And I yep. mean like Harley biker, I mean like bicycler, right? Correct. <laughs> um, yeah. I cycle every morning for about 12 and a half, 12 and a half miles. So give us, you know, an idea of maybe a problem that you might have or have had with cycling and what would be an awesome idea there to be like, hey, this would be make a great product because I'm always running into this problem as a cyclist. Yeah, so I actually just bought a bunch of stuff for this uh, cycling effort because just recently it's gotten much, much colder here in Las Vegas. So it's something like the 40s or low 40s in the morning. So it's not so bad when you're walking because the wind's not blowing, but when you're riding a bike, the actual wind is hitting you because you're generating speed. So my entire body is freezing cold. So I had to then get like, you know, like thermal uh, long johns for my legs. I got a full ski mask essentially, but it, it literally was like a cycling brand that was selling it. Um, I also got uh, like uh, gloves, literally cycling gloves. I would never have bought them. I mean, they're not like super thick. They're, they're kind of more functional, but they do keep my hands nice and warm. And these are just literally things that, that could be used for skiing. They could be used for anything, but because it happened to be when I looked up cycling gear for cold weather or, you know, cold weather, cycling clothes or something like that, these are the things that came up and they were by cycling brands. And again, that's not something that you would think like, Oh, I've got to stay just on like bike locks, uh, you know, bike light, lights and like all this other stuff. If you just think a little bit outside the box, I guarantee you there's some of these stuff. And most of them aren't like really like two, two size um, uh, apparent on that clothing stuff, like long johns, like the the thing, like you can buy like different sizes as long as the waist is, is, is not like super tight, but they kind of stretch. So like I bought large by accident and I'm not a large, but they fit perfectly fine. So I'm not going to sit there and worry about that. So there's like these kinds of things. Now, I, again, I don't usually say clothing, but there's certain things like that. But even like bike lock, bike lights, uh, you know, even like um, how, like a bike pump. These are things, inner tubes. Inner tubes are great because people don't even think to sell the inner tubes. They want to sell the thing like the pump or the, 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 the cycling kit, kit. But inner tubes are so cheap. There's, there's only certain few sizes of those. And if you just kind of pick the first couple, like most popular ones, you could start with like two sizes of inner tubes and potentially launch your, your entire Amazon business on something as boring as the inner tube of a bicycle, which is pretty crazy. So these are things that I bought just for that in the last six months. I mean, I bought pretty much everything that that, that bike needs to have. And see, I love picking people's brain about that because not only do you have private label product opportunities here perhaps, but you also have bundling opportunities here because yeah. all of those products are probably made by manufacturers that are already making them and reaching out to them and saying, hey, I'd like to make a you know cyclist for cold weather accessory kit where you're putting maybe the, the things like the gloves and the ski mask type things together because those are things that may not have, they're not as size um, determined, you know, as opposed mm -hmm. to like the long johns or something might have to be small, large, extra large, whatever, but a ski Ski mask is generally a one size fits most and gloves. Okay. Maybe they can come in small, medium, large. I have really tiny hands. So I'm always thinking about glove sizes, but you guys, this is what we're talking about here. We're talking about looking at your own life. So, okay. You don't have any hobbies. Great. I'm, I'm sure. But do you watch TV? Do you watch movies? Do you have, you have to drive your car? Um, is there anything that annoys you? Here's another way to be creative about coming up with product ideas. And this could be in bundles and and or private label or single label items. For the last 10 things you bought on Amazon, go back to those product pages and read customer reviews. Look for things like this, because this is how I write reviews, because I want someone to improve their product and or create a bundle for me. So you go back through and say, I love this, but I wish it had blah, blah, blah. This is hello, like bright neon shining opportunity. When you see customers saying, I love this product, but I wish it came with an accessory stand, or I wish it came with a, um, a holder or a this or a that or whatever, all the case, all the things. So you start 
reading reviews on popular products or even not popular products, just products that you've purchased and you start reading what people say, the customers will tell you, please meet my need with the following product because they're not into product like development. They're just like, hey, I wish this had a stand. And I'm like, I can make a stand for this or I can have a stand made or I can you know, go to the private label sector, have a stand made for this and then say it's compatible with such and such a thing. And now you've got a product that at least you know one person. And I'm telling you for every one person that leaves a review and says something like that, I guarantee you there's probably a hundred more people that have the same desire, at least. I mean, let's, let's be real here. There's billions of people in the world. And I'm sure that if you're solving a problem for one person, many other people have the same problem. So just even if you don't have any ideas, start with the last 10 products you bought on Amazon and start reading reviews and looking for customer clues. So let's get into a little bit of that, of talking about solving those problems and how to speak maybe to your ideal client to make sure that you have the right message. You mentioned using some humor in your listings. I, I That's pretty new for me because um, most people are straight to the point and they're trying to use all the SEO words and everything else. So talk about your humor approach for a moment because I kind of like that. Yeah, so I think most people are trying to appeal to Amazon's algorithm as they write their listings, which is if you know anything about shopping on Amazon, because we all shop on Amazon, when you go to those types of listings, you get kind of bored. It's like reading a dictionary or it's like pretty dry in the sense of like the fact that, you know, they'll put the features like how big the product is, what it's made of, the material, all that stuff. And you're like, I don't really care about that. What I want to know is how does it help me solve the problem that I'm looking at this product for? Like, for example, that, you know, the bike lock. Well, I don't want my bike to get stolen if I have to like lock it up somewhere. Okay, so instead of telling me about the aluminum titanium alloy or, you know, how many keys it comes with or it's a combination and a key lock or whatever, all that stuff, tell me how it's how hard it is to steal that bike once that thing is on there, right? Like, that's what I want. I want to know how secure it's going to be with that bike lock on there. If it's, you know, if somebody can cut through it with some bolt cutters in two seconds, well, that's not very secure, right? Because that's how bikes get stolen. They just go clip the chain with a bolt cutter, steal the bike and walk away with it. So these are things that you can use in the messaging. Yes, it's very straightforward that if you think that, hey, I'm selling a bike lock, of course, the idea is that it's going to make your bike secure. You still have to say that in the listing. People think that you don't have to be obvious with your language, but here's the best part. When you talk like that, so, what, you know, essentially, why are the customers using it? What problem is it solving? How do they feel when they use it? How did they feel before when they weren't using it? Use that language. It actually has tons and tons of relevant keywords in that language. You just don't know it because you're thinking like, I have to put bike lock, bike locks, you know, locks for bikes, lock for bike. Everybody thinks they got to stuff all these versions of the keywords into the bullets and, and, the, and the, you know, product description and the title. But really, if you just talk like a human being, all those words come in there, plus a lot of other great stuff like security, uh, no bolt cutter, like, you know, bolt cutters might be in there, like just things that are be relevant around what that lock is being sold for. So essentially what we always say is start with, you know, who's using it, you know, understand your ideal client. So people who ride bikes would clearly be the people using bike locks. Why are they using it? Well, to make sure that their bike is secure. And then talk about the problems they have. Like maybe they've had a bike stolen before and then they just lost $600 on a bike or $800 on a bike. That's pretty expensive. But if you've got the right you know, bike lock, it might cost you 50 bucks, but it's worth 50 bucks versus 600 or $800 for a bike. So these are the things See, that you kind of right have to see. right there, I yeah. love the fact that you just like in one sentence summed up the problem and justified the purchase, right? Because mm -hmm. when people are reading your listing, they're in decision-making mode. They've searched for something already, which by the way, um, I have, I mean, I want to say, yeah, but in, in one way and in, in saying that like those attributes, like don't, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We're like, we yeah. want to speak like human beings for sure. We also want to make sure they understand who, what, when, where, why. And the only reason why I'm saying that is because like, literally yesterday I'm searching for something for my house on Amazon and I was super annoyed that there was like four paragraphs full of description but the one thing that I wanted to know was the size of this thing because yeah. it didn't show and I had to scroll way down and finally had to find it at the way bottom of the listing and I was like why why do I, I need to know up front so use the first bullet to give everybody the attributes of the item and then go through the bullets again exactly like that to say, 
would you spend $50 to save your $800 bike from being, you know, I love that approach of just kind of being like, talk to people because people, not algorithms are going to buy that product. Mm -hmm. People buy, they're scrolling on their phones. Most of the time they're on a commercial, they're, they're watching TV and they're like, oh yeah, I need to, you know, look for this or that or whatever. They're scrolling on Amazon. They're going to see their tight, your title and your picture first. And then they're going to go and say, Hey, I'm really interested in this product. This looks like an awesome product. And then they're going to read that and they're going to want to feel secure that you know your $50 bike lock is really going to save my $800 investment and that is the language that we want to talk it's it's almost like applying the golden rule right it's like do to others as you would have them do to you write a listing that you would want to read what would you want to know about this product and what would make you buy it as far as I mean okay so we don't always buy all the products that we sell right I mean I know I sell stuff I would probably never buy um, because I'm not my ideal customer but you have to put yourself in their shoes and say what is going to get them to say yes to this listing it's 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 kind of you know it's almost salesy right like not every one of us is in sales but really speaking to the problem you solve like this $50 lock will save your $800 investment as soon as you said that I'm like I'm buying your bike lock because that's the problem I have I don't want my $800 bike stolen yeah. so I love the language there and I love kind of using some humor and talking to humans rather than yes algorithm and bots let's be real like that's who is driving the traffic to our listing but if we can cover both and we're in a really good spot yeah. And I mean, the algorithm is based on human searches anyway. So it's like, it's driven by real people doing the research and, and, and finding the products. Um, but yeah, actually, that's a great point. And what, what, what you mentioned about the features and the, the attributes and stuff. Yeah, usually what we do is we put the benefit and then explain it with the feature. So like, save your $800 bike with a $50 bike lock, and then this titanium alloy, indestructible bike lock or whatever, right after that is pretty much how we write the bullet points. So that way, you know, exactly how these things are happening, but you get the benefit first and then you get the understanding of why that is the case, which makes for a really compelling argument. And yeah, you say it's salesy. I, I kind of agree, but also there's a thing about it is, is if you don't try to sell something and you just provide the actual real truth about your product and provide the problems and solutions and all that stuff, you don't even have to try to sell the product. People are already looking for it. It's like, I was talking to another guy um, about the sales process. And I say, the fundamental shift you always have to make is you're not selling anything. You're offering a solution to a problem. Exactly. If you stop thinking that I have to sell this, you'll be a lot better at marketing and putting your, your listings together and all that copywriting stuff. Absolutely. And I think that's, that goes back again to basically talking to yourself as the customer. What would you exactly. want to say to you that would, that would cause you to buy that product? It's not really pushy or salesy. It really just is. Tell me what this is and tell me how it benefits me. I mean, everybody, every customer out there is asking the question, whether subconsciously or just upfront, what's in it for me? Every time you, I'm going, like I'm looking actively for a shelving unit for my house. We just remodeled and we have this big giant vaulted wall and I want this shelving unit on there. And of course, every single thing I'm scrolling through is like, what's in it for me? What is the size? What are other people saying about this? What are people saying about how it's put together? You know, all this different stuff. And is it is it the right, you know, is this going to be the right fit and the right product for me? And as soon as somebody answers the question of what's in it for me, what are the benefits of me buying this wonderful idea? Is it easiest? assembly? Is it, you know, is there a guarantee? Is there um, something where, you know, they offer great customer service, the colors are true to match, whatever they are, like, tell me what's in it for me. And that's what makes me ultimately make that decision. Yeah. Awesome. So let's just wrapping up here. Let's um, let's touch one more subject on if if for those really stubborn people out there that are like, OK, I hear your guys' tips and I understand that. Like, what is just one piece or place that, that you feel like is a good place for people to start that literally have never sold a single product in their life? Like literally complete newbie. Like I want to start on Amazon because all of a sudden I'm laid off from my restaurant job and I can't serve tables right now. So I need to start something online and I have a couple thousand bucks. What, what is step one? Yeah. So I think one of the things that you could do, like you said, is look at your past history of purchases on Amazon. That's a really good place. Think thinks of things that you bought online specifically because those are things that you can sell online. Uh, another couple of things is essentially 
if you even, if you just maybe carry a little notepad or make, maybe write it on your phone, anytime something angers you, makes you mad, inconvenience you, like basically anytime you have a problem in your day, be like, man, I wish there was a thing for this. Write that down. Now, I'm not saying you have to invent anything because that's not the idea here. But generally speaking, there's probably a thing that helps with whatever you're upset about. Like, you know, if you're stuck in traffic, I hate traffic. I go insane. So I need to listen to music. And my stupid Toyota Corolla is only a 2013 or something. It didn't have Bluetooth. So I had to go and get a little Bluetooth thing, you know, plug that in so that way I could play my music off my phone. That's one little product. Maybe I need an auxiliary cord. These are little things that like are out there that solve problems all day, every day. So you can make a note of any problem you have. Maybe you're cooking, you have an issue. Hey, you know, I need new thing for this. Um, you know, all these other little things. And I just realized that I didn't actually mention anything about the humor part, but I'll get to that in a second. So I'll talk about humor in the listing as well. But essentially, when you find those problems and those issues that you have, you know that you're passionate about it. Because I think most people would find that they're more passionate about things they hate or are annoyed by than even things that they love sometimes. In fact, uh, this is, you know, my favorite American football team is the Washington football team. It's a stupid name. I know it was even stupider before, but they're going to get a new name, hopefully. But what I'll tell you is as much as I love that football team, I actually hate the Dallas Cowboys even more than I love the Washington football team. So if somebody <laughs> is around me and I see Dallas Cowboys stuff, especially on a game day, or especially if we're playing each other, I'm just like, I don't want to talk to you. Don't talk to me. I'd rather, I'd rather just you wait till the end of the day before. As I long talk as you, you don't hate the Super Bowl <laughs> champions, we're all set. That's all I got to say. Die hard, longtime Chiefs fan here. So as yeah. long as you didn't say that, this would interview would have been over. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I feel you on that. So continue. Sorry. Yeah. So, so, and the good thing about this is if you have that passion, that's when you can kind of throw some humor in there because you kind of know what's frustrating. Like, you know, maybe it's, you know, sitting in traffic and you don't have any music to listen to, or, you know, maybe I have to listen to the radio. So for example, for that Bluetooth thing that I had to buy, it's like, are you sick of listening to these annoying radio DJs and all their commercials? Yeah. Okay. So plug in this Bluetooth thing to connect to your phone, ad free, listen to it on YouTube or whatever, you know, your own music library on your phone. So that way you don't have to listen to that stuff anymore. And that's using a little bit of humor. I mean, it's not overtly hilarious, but you're talking about annoying DJs and their commercials. And then you can maybe even say something down the line of like jam out while you're, you know, sitting in traffic, even though you hate everybody around you or something like that. These are little things that people, when they read the listing, they're like, yeah, that's me. That's exactly how I feel. Relatability. Yeah. This is exactly. relatability guys, relatability to the fact that like, this is why it's so important to start with things that, you know, I know so many people have asked me, they've even offered me thousands of dollars to just give them a list of products and categories and vendors where they can just, you know, give me a list. I'll pay you thousands to just buy, pick off a list. The reality is I won't give you a list. I won't even sell you a list as much as I want all of your coin. Thank you very much. <laughs> I am not going to sell you a list because I actually care about you. And I want you to learn for yourself that this is possible. Just like the traffic incident, just like the fact that he hates the Dallas Cowboys more than he loves his own team. I mean, we all have our nemesis teams right there. Right. <laughs> but the reality here is, is that it have to be relatable. That's why we say, start with your knowledge bank. I had my dad pass away from cancer and while he had cancer and while he was going through all of his stuff and chemo and this and that, my mom and I had 101 product ideas because we had so many problems with the chemo with the transportation. He had lost some mobility in his arm, which then created other problems. And we're like, there's not really good products to fix this problem. There's not really good products to make a cancer patient more comfortable in a sense that like, you know, there's some medicines or some supplements, things like that, but like physical, practical things, especially when you start losing mobility and just the, all the things like that. If you are gluten-free or all of a sudden I'm type one diabetic over here, there's lots of products out there that make a type one diabetics life way easier and mm -hmm. cooler. I'll, I'll just be honest. You know, I have this little checker thing and it was ugly and I had to carry it with me all the time. And I was like, but then I found out they make pretty decals for them. I mean, it's something that's silly to some people, but to me, if I have to carry this little black device with me everywhere, I don't like black. I want it to be rose gold. I want it to be shiny and sparkly, whatever. I want it to say, you know, I will poke you with my needle if you get too close. Like, I don't know. But like the, the reality is you need to think. I mean, this generation just wants, or any generation really is just like, just give me the answers. Give me the answers. They want to fill in the bubbles, right? As fast as they can. The reality is if you can think, 
if you can sit down for a 15 minute hustle and just think about your customer, think about your own problems and what annoys you and what ticks you off and things that are problems in the area. Oh, I wish this, I wish that. Those are products that people buy because you're not the only one with the problem. So make sure you're relatable with your product. And I love how you're writing listings that are relatable because that would make me laugh. And not only would make me laugh, it's because it's like, I feel you. I relate Mm -hmm. to that because that is a real, the struggle is real. I say that all the time and think about the struggle is real. What's the real struggle in your life? Even if it's petty guys. I mean, honestly, most of the time we're buying products to solve problems is because it's a petty problem, but it's still a problem. No shame, no apology. I got problems. And it's, it's, it's just the way it goes. And so do you guys. So what are your problems? I mean, maybe that's the new quote of the day. It's like, (laughs) tell me your problems. Ask a Facebook poll, do it on Instagram, something like, Hey, what is your number one gripe of the day? Please no political posts, right? (laughs) Like aside from the, the, the political strife, we're all going through at this moment. Like, tell me something that really annoys you and then ask people their problems and then start figuring out what products could fill in the gaps. So solve those problems. So again, I appreciate every single thing that you've said. This is so awesome. Great content. And then, you know, you guys, listeners, you guys are all without excuse. Now we literally gave you like between the two of us, like 10 practical tips. You can go right now and start looking for products and problems to solve, even within your own space, by just looking around at every single thing that's in the room or in the vehicle that you're sitting in right now, wherever you're listening, look around you and look at your Amazon store. So those are the tips. Look at the Amazon store then of all the things that you bought, the last 10 things you bought, read the reviews on those products, figure out what's ticking people off and annoying people and all kinds of different niches and start plugging in the products, researching, Googling products that would solve that problem because you don't have to invent them. Sometimes if it's better, if you do, because then that's your private label product. But if not, you can find bundles and products and wholesale solutions to any of these things. So Isaac, thanks so much for being on here. Can you tell us a little bit more about where people can connect with you? Yeah, they can actually, uh, I think you'll, you have a link so they can go to the show notes below, but basically uh, goteamreal.com. We have some free training there to kind of understand, especially if you're into the private label. Um, now, obviously wholesale bundling is, is definitely a way to go. Uh, private label is, I would say just a little bit more costly because you have to actually buy the inventory in, in bulk and stuff and create that stuff. Uh, but if that is something that you're interested in, you can go there, check it out. Even if you don't get into private label, there's a lot of the free training goes over all the good stuff about marketing understanding like product research and it really helps with any any facet of of amazon selling but yeah i think that's one thing and i I just wanted to add one more quick thing about a a way that you can find product ideas because i i just thought about like how you know when people call each other on the phone they're always like complaining about something it's never like hey how you doing like hey things growing great oh then it immediately spirals into something they're complaining about I bet you that thing you're complaining about is probably solvable by some sort of product on Amazon as well. So if you catch yourself complaining about something to somebody that you're talking to the phone on, maybe write it down and say, Hey, is there something out there that fixes this problem? But um, yeah, so go team um, Glad to be here. And, and hopefully your listeners will get a lot of value out of this conversation. I'm sure that they will. So yeah, goteamreal.com is where you can find Isaac and his team. Lots of free training. They have a podcast as well. So make sure you want to tune into that. And again, thank you so much for your time and your effort. Oh, and the 